Hi, I'm Dr. Laura Cahalan, and I've been asked to speak to you about Article 41.2 of the Constitution. I'm actually recording this today on St. Bridget's Day, which I think is very appropriate. Now, you've already been given some background to the provision, but before we discuss replacing it or deleting it, it might be useful just to have a brief look at the wording of the provision itself. Now, many people assume that the provision says that a woman's place is in the home. It doesn't, but you might say the implication is there with the language used, for example, her life within the home or duties within the home. And many people, when they read this provision, ask why was it put in the Constitution in the first place and also what was intended by it? And this was a question which was actually asked by a small number of women's groups at the time the Constitution was published. And in response to that, de Valera addressed the doll, and he did say that the intention was not to interfere with the rights of women um, and that it was not intended to prevent women from working. But on the question of what was intended, and in particular whether a concrete economic benefit was intended, that was a little less clear. Now, de Valera did mention the possibility of providing a, a sort of state support to women for performing what he said was a fundamental service to the community in her role as wife and mother. But he also said that this should be left open so that successive governments would have the freedom to deal with it as they saw fit. So while not explicit, the potential to use this provision to require the state to financially support women in the home would have been possible. But despite the grand language used, it was not used in that way. And despite the, the assurances from those in power that women's rights would not be curtailed, that is exactly what happened in the years that followed. And while societal changes and the influence of the women's movements later on meant many improvements in the lives of women, this constitutional provision was not part of that change. And so that raises the question, is the provision of any use in law? And the short answer is probably not. Now, the direct question of whether the state would be required to facilitate a mother financially to remain in the home was never actually raised in a court case. Um, and the provision itself was really only ever raised as a central issue in one court case, but that was a case which was based on the ownership of the family home. So it was slightly different, uh, but it was unsuccessful in the Supreme Court. Now, we don't have time today to bring you through the various cases, but on the basis of the interpretation in this case and in a couple of other cases, we can say that it's very unlikely that an interpretation would now be given which would give any concrete benefit to women in the home from this current provision. So then what are your options? Most people would agree that this is now not an appropriate provision for inclusion in our constitution. So we can either take it out entirely or replace it with something else. The problem is, there is very little consensus in all of the various reform reports which have been carried out to date on what should replace it. And there are advantages and disadvantages with each option. So we're just going to take a brief look at the two principal options. The first option is to replace the provision with a gender neutral alternative which recognises the value of care work in the home. And the wording which is on the slide is essentially what was recommended by the Department of Justice Task Force, which was set up to consider the recommendations of the Constitutional Convention. Now, this one looks like a reasonable option. It has the benefit of removing the outmoded and paternalistic language which currently exists, while also giving recognition to the work that carers do in the home. In terms of its location, if it's being included in Article 41, which is the article on the family, it's generally agreed that it would have to be limited to carers in the home. But it could alternatively be placed into Article 45 and it could be opened up to carers generally because Article 45 itself is non-justiciable. And that means that it has no legal effect. So you can't take a case to court on the basis of anything which is said in Article 45. 
Article 45 is simply intended to be headlines or guidelines for the Oireachtas in terms of creating legislation. Of course, it's likely that even if placed in Article 41, that a provision like this would more than likely not result in any financial right for carers. And that's because the language proposed that the state would endeavour to ensure does not impose any obligation on the state. Although it's important to note that there would always be the possibility that a court could interpret the provision in a way so as to confer this type of benefit in the future, but that is unlikely. Now you might argue that there is a benefit in having a provision where the main aim is to give recognition to carers and which demonstrates that the constitution acknowledges what they do, but that is essentially all that this would be doing. And another argument is that at least when you have some reference to it in the constitution, that that provides an incentive to lawmakers when they're proposing legislative changes in the area. But of course, you don't need something to be mentioned in the constitution in order to make legislative changes. Now, one final issue with this is that there's always the possibility, albeit a vague one, that this could be interpreted by a court in the future in some unintended way. Just to give you an example, the current provision was interpreted in the past in order to deny social welfare payments to deserted husbands. And in another case, to justify not having women on juries. So the point here is that it's important to be clear about what you're putting into the constitution. And it's better to try and ensure as little ambiguity as possible. Now we've learned lessons from the Eighth Amendment about how amendments can have unexpected consequences. So if you do want to create a financial right, then that should be stated. Otherwise, it's likely that this sort of provision would be symbolic. And that brings us then to option two. Option two is to create a duty to require the state to provide for carers in economic terms. And the idea here would be to ensure that the state would have a responsibility to provide for carers and to have this expressly acknowledged in the text of the constitution. Now, the first issue here is that this has never been proposed as a reform option before because we don't know what the potential costs involved would be. Also, providing expressly for an economic right in the Constitution is very unusual. And the only one that we currently expressly have is the right to free primary education. Now, of course, it would be possible to do this. Um, it would also be somewhat controversial. And the reason is because the constitution specifically gives the job of determining resources to the government. It's their job to decide based on the state of the economy and so on, what resources can go where. So an express financial right for carers in the constitution would take that control out of the hands of government. Now, some might feel that is a positive thing, but the other side is that we've no idea what such a move would cost. So this option would require a lot of accounting. And the other issue is that it's quite unlikely that this option would be accepted by government for the reasons just outlined. Of course, the other option is simply to remove it. Now, a disadvantage of deleting the provision is that you're removing any recognition of care work from the constitution itself, if it's felt that that recognition has value. In terms of the positives, deleting the article has the advantage of clarity, certainty, and simplicity. In the first place, it removes the derogatory and insulting language, but it also removes the potential for any unintended interpretation of the provision at some point in the future. It also moves away from having inoperative and arguably pointless clauses in the constitution. The current provision has been of no use to carers and it's quite possible that a replacement provision would have the same fate. And the crucial issue here is that reform is badly needed in the area of care work, but you don't need a constitutional amendment in order to address that. In fact, legislative action 
is the only way that real change can be achieved in this area. So you could say that having arguments about what wording should replace Article 41.2 might only prove to be a further distraction and might further distance any potential real reform and real reform can easily be achieved through legislation. So those are all of the options. As you can see, there are arguments on both sides for all of the options. So you've quite a lot to think about. I wish you luck with all of your deliberations.